It's 1940, and Britain's skies are a battlefield. The Luftwaffe dominates the air, and the RAF needs a weapon fast. Something faster, fiercer, deadlier than anything in service. Enter an engine so radical, so brutally powerful, it was almost too dangerous to use. The Napier Sabre wasn't just another power plant, it was an engineering gamble on an untested concept that promised unmatched speed and power. It could propel a fighter to victory or kill its pilot in an instant. This is the story of the machine that turned warplanes into predators and mechanics into miracle workers. The shocking truth behind Napier's Sabre engine. Number 1. Born from Desperation The late 1930s were a dangerous time to be complacent. Nazi Germany's rearmament program was producing fighters that outpaced anything Britain could field. The Air Ministry wanted more than parity, it wanted dominance. They demanded an engine capable of delivering over 2,000 horsepower in a compact airframe, something that could power a next-generation interceptor fast enough to catch bombers and strong enough to survive a dogfight. Napier and Son, best known for earlier racing and aero engines, saw an opening. But instead of refining conventional designs, they proposed something radical. A 24-cylinder H-type engine using sleeve valve technology. The concept promised higher compression ratios, better airflow, and a blistering power output far beyond existing V12 engines. On paper, it was revolutionary. But this wasn't a government-funded moonshot, it began as a private venture. Napier engineers worked in relative secrecy, often clashing with officials who doubted the viability of such an unconventional approach. The world hadn't yet seen the scale of devastation Nazi bombers could unleash, but forward-thinking strategists knew the clock was ticking. By 1938, the Sabre project was formally adopted under Air Ministry Specification F.18-37, intended for a new Hawker fighter that would become the Typhoon. The stakes skyrocketed. This was no longer about engineering pride, it was national survival. If Napier failed, Britain might enter the coming war without an engine capable of matching the German threat. The Sabre's early reputation was already polarizing in the aviation community. Some saw it as visionary, others as dangerously over-engineered. But one thing was certain. Britain had just placed one of its most critical bets on an engine design that was years ahead of its time and years away from being truly reliable. The gamble had begun. Number 2. A Beast of Unconventional Design The Napier Sabre wasn't built to follow rules, it was built to break them. At its heart was an H-24 configuration, essentially two flat-12 engines stacked together, driving a single crankshaft through a complex gear system. But its most audacious feature was the sleeve valve system. Instead of conventional poppet valves, the Sabre's cylinders were lined with rotating sleeves that controlled the intake and exhaust ports. This allowed massive airflow, higher RPM limits, and compression ratios that poppet valve engines couldn't dream of. In theory, this meant more horsepower in a more compact design, reducing frontal area and drag critical for fighters like the Hawker Typhoon. The numbers were intoxicating. Early prototypes hinted at 2,200 horsepower, almost double the Merlin's early war output. With development, it could reach over 3,500 horsepower, pushing fighters beyond 450 miles per hour in level flight. Engineers envisioned typhoons and tempests screaming across Europe, smashing bombers and strafing tanks with unstoppable force. But innovation came with a price. The sleeve valve mechanism was intricate and maintenance heavy. Its tolerances were microscopic, meaning even minor machining flaws could cause catastrophic failures. The oiling system had to be flawless to prevent galling of the sleeves. Cooling the tightly packed cylinders was a nightmare, and the labyrinth of moving parts meant manufacturing complexity rivaled that of entire aircraft. 
To Napier's engineers, the Sabre was a thoroughbred racehorse, temperamental but unmatched in speed. To many in the RAF, it was a mechanical prima donna, one that would demand constant care in the chaos of war. Yet despite the risks, the Air Ministry stuck with the design. The Sabre was no safe bet. It was a leap into the unknown. If it worked, it could change the war. If it failed, it could leave Britain's next-generation fighters stranded on the ground. Number 3. Trials of Fire and Failure The Sabre's first real-world tests were a brutal awakening. On the test stand, the engine's roar promised performance beyond imagination. In the air, it became a different story, a story written in oil leaks, overheating gauges, and seized crankshafts. The sleeve valve system, while brilliant in theory, was unforgiving in practice. Carbon buildup and lubrication issues caused the sleeves to seize mid-operation, locking the engine solid in fractions of a second. For pilots, that meant instant power loss at hundreds of miles per hour. There was no warning, just a jolt, a dead propeller, and the sickening realization that you were now in a glider over enemy territory. Overheating was another demon. The Sabre's compact, high-output design generated enormous heat, and the cooling system struggled to keep up. Radiators burst, coolant boiled, and ground crews cursed the engine as they worked through the night to get just one operational Typhoon airborne. Then there was the starting system, a hand-cranked inertia starter that sometimes needed multiple ground crew to wrestle into life. In cold weather, oil thickened, making starts even more unreliable. Sabres became infamous for refusing to fire up just when they were needed most. Pilots were torn. When the Sabre ran well, its power was intoxicating. It could rip through the sky faster than almost anything else. But that power came wrapped in uncertainty. Test flights ended in forced landings. Combat missions ended early. Squadron leaders quietly questioned whether trusting the RAF's future to this volatile machine was sheer madness. And yet, the war left no time for perfection. Every floor was met with frantic redesigns. Napier's engineers tore apart failed units, redesigned sleeves, improved lubricants, and tweaked tolerances. They knew the stakes. Either tame this beast, or watch Britain's war effort stumble before it could strike back. Number 4. Racing the Clock to War By 1941, the pressure was suffocating. Britain needed a high-speed interceptor capable of stopping German bombers before they reached their targets, and the Hawker Typhoon, powered by the Sabre, was supposed to be that aircraft. But the engine's reliability issues threatened to derail the entire program. Napier's factory became a war front of its own. Engineers and fitters worked 18-hour days, sleeping on benches, driven by a shared understanding. If they failed, British cities would burn. Every successful flight test was a small victory. Every failure, a gut punch. The Air Ministry demanded results yesterday. The Typhoon's early operational record was grim. Engine failures mid-mission forced pilots to ditch or bail out. German fighters exploited its low-altitude speed advantage only when the Sabre behaved, and that wasn't often enough. The RAF faced a dilemma. Ground the Typhoon until the Sabre was fixed, or keep flying and risk losing aircraft and men. The decision was made to keep pushing. Napier introduced tighter manufacturing tolerances, improved the sleeve valve metallurgy, and upgraded the cooling system. Oil formulations were changed to better protect the intricate sleeve bearings. Slowly, the engine's reliability crept upward. But time was not on their side. Across the channel, the Luftwaffe was perfecting new tactics. In the Mediterranean, British forces needed fighter bombers yesterday. And in the factories, every day lost to redesigns was another day Britain's frontline squadrons flew outdated hurricanes against superior German aircraft. Then came the breakthrough. New production techniques allowed more precise machining of sleeve valve components, dramatically reducing failures. 
cooling efficiency improved, and the Sabre's performance began to match its promise. By late 1942, it was ready, not perfect, but finally dependable enough to send into full-scale combat. The clock hadn't stopped, but Britain had just gained precious minutes in the race for survival. Number 5. Enter the Typhoon and Tempest When the Sabre finally matured, it transformed its host aircraft into something extraordinary. The Hawker Typhoon, originally plagued by engine failures and poor high-altitude performance, became a terror at low level. With over 2,200 horsepower driving a four-bladed propeller, it could dive on German bombers at nearly 400 miles per hour and tear through armoured vehicles with rockets and cannon fire. The Typhoon's role shifted from interceptor to ground attack monster. Flying low and fast, Typhoon squadrons became the scourge of German supply lines. Sabre-powered strikes shredded rail networks, convoys and tank columns across occupied France. Luftwaffe pilots learned to fear its sudden, roaring appearance over the treetops. Then came the Hawker Tempest, the Sabre's ultimate showcase. A refined airframe, improved aerodynamics, and an even more powerful Sabre IV pushed speeds beyond 430 miles per hour. The Tempest could chase down V-1 flying bombs, outperform Fock Wolf 190s and tangle with Mi 262 jets at low altitudes. In the closing months of the war, Tempest squadrons swept the skies clean, dominating everything beneath 20,000 feet. The Sabre's brute force also allowed the Tempest to carry heavier weapon loads than most single-engine fighters of the era. This versatility made it equally deadly against aircraft, armor, and infrastructure. By 1944, the Sabre's reputation had flipped from a temperamental liability to a war-winning powerhouse. Still, its maintenance demands remained notorious. Ground crews worked tirelessly to keep the high-strung engine combat ready, but pilots now trusted it in battle. When the Sabre roared to life and the throttle went forward, there was no mistaking the sensation you were strapped to one of the most powerful piston engines ever built, and the enemy was about to feel it. In Typhoon and Tempest hands, the Sabre didn't just serve, it conquered. Number 6. The Dark Side of Maintenance Even at its wartime peak, the Napier Sabre was no ordinary engine to service. It was a marvel of mechanical ambition, wrapped in layers of unforgiving complexity. The heart of the challenge lay in its intricate sleeve valve system, a masterpiece of precision engineering that required tolerances so tight they left no room for error. For ground crews, working on the Sabre meant long hours hunched over a cramped engine bay, often in mud, rain or freezing wind. Something as simple as a spark plug change could consume hours, with mechanics contorting themselves to reach hidden fittings. The tightly packed cylinders left little clearance, and dropping even the smallest washer could mean complete disassembly before flight. The Sabre's demands didn't stop at mechanical access. It was notoriously sensitive to oil quality. Dirty or degraded oil could cause the sleeves to seize, turning the engine into a 2,000-pound paperweight. Cooling was another relentless battle. High power output generated intense heat, and any failure in coolant flow could warp critical components within minutes. Field conditions made everything harder. Dust and grit in North Africa, bitter cold in Northern Europe, and the general chaos of forward airfields tested the patience and skill of even the most seasoned mechanics. Spare parts were never guaranteed, and many were so finely machined they couldn't be improvised. Yet, in spite of the headaches, the Sabre inspired a rare loyalty. Mechanics took pride in mastering its quirks, developing tricks to coax maximum performance from a machine others feared. They preheated oil in winter, improvised tools, and created meticulous maintenance logs to track each engine's personality. Pilots understood that their lives depended on this unspoken bond. 
every sortie became a shared achievement. Mechanics trusting pilots not to overstrain the engine. Pilots trusting mechanics to hand them a machine ready for combat. The Sabre's demands were steep, but those who met them knew they were tending to one of the most formidable piston engines ever built. It wasn't just maintenance, it was a form of devotion. Number 7. Legacy of a Reluctant Legend When the guns fell silent in 1945, the Napier Sabre faced an uncertain future. Jet propulsion was on the horizon, offering speeds no piston engine could match. Yet for a brief but brilliant moment, the Sabre had been the most powerful production piston engine in the world, a mechanical pinnacle forged in wartime desperation. Its engineering innovations, especially the sleeve valve system, pushed performance boundaries. The Sabre's incredible power-to-weight ratio redefined what single-engine fighters could achieve, allowing the Hawker Typhoon and Tempest to dominate low-altitude combat and smash German ground forces with devastating efficiency. In the hands of skilled pilots, these aircraft crippled supply lines, destroyed armor columns, and even intercepted the infamous V-1 flying bombs. But the Sabre's legacy was as complex as the machine itself. Pilots often spoke of it with admiration, praising its raw power and responsiveness. Mechanics, though respectful, remembered it as a demanding and unforgiving partner, one that consumed time, skill, and resources in equal measure. Historians would later see it as both a triumph of engineering ambition and a cautionary tale about complexity in mass production. Its operational record, however, speaks loudly. Typhoons and tempests collectively destroyed tens of thousands of vehicles, disrupted logistics networks across occupied Europe, and helped secure air superiority in the war's final years. The Sabre's roar over the battlefield became a sound German troops would not forget. Post-war, the Sabre's influence lingered in engineering circles. While few post-war engines adopted sleeve valves, lessons learned from its metallurgy, lubrication, and high RPM operation fed into other designs. Still, the world was moving on. Jets captured the imagination and the budgets of air forces everywhere. Today, only a handful of Sabre engines remain, displayed in museums as silent reminders of a time when Britain bet everything on a radical idea. None fly, but those who once heard the deep, urgent growl of a Sabre at full throttle remember it as something primal, a machine that didn't just power aircraft, but changed the course of battles. The Sabre's story is one of risk, reward, and relentless ambition. It may have been a reluctant legend, but it left an indelible mark on aviation history. Today, only a handful of Sabres survive, most as museum pieces. None are currently airworthy, their intricate sleeve valve hearts long silent. But for those who remember, the sound of a Sabre at full throttle was unforgettable. A deep, urgent growl that signalled unstoppable speed and power. The Napier Sabre's legacy is one of risk and reward. It proved that pushing beyond conventional limits can yield extraordinary results, but only at great cost. It was a reluctant legend, born of desperation, forged in frustration, and remembered with equal parts awe and respect.